imagine my surprise when I knew I was giving this talk and two things, not one, but two things um, came, uh, were announced this morning. One is that Bernie Sanders uh, is going to the Vatican to speak at the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences uh, next week. Now try to imagine um, a Democratic presidential candidate over the last 20 or 30 years being invited to the Vatican uh, in the middle of a campaign and um, makes it even better. It's a Jewish socialist uh, Democratic <laughs> presidential candidate uh, being invited to the Vatican. I think on the Pope Francis side, you have a, a re-emphasis of uh, Catholicism's, but also Christianity's, uh, the broader Christianity's emphasis on social justice. You have an internationalization of the uh, Christian uh, vision, uh, and, um, and especially with his emphasis on refugees, on immigrants, um, and on global poverty. Um, and this is um, a, a radical change uh, from what we have been accustomed to over the last uh, several years um, that could shake up this campaign in interesting ways. Sanders this morning noted that Pope Francis is to his left uh, on uh, many uh, economic uh, questions. Um, and I think this shift um, within the Catholic Church um, is not really surprising. It is actually where the church was a long time ago and not that long ago. And I think one of the um, interesting questions in this campaign, and this is what I'm trying to set up rather than resolve a conversation, um, is what will Pope Francis's impact be uh, as this campaign goes forward? It's very striking uh, that the two candidates who like to quote Pope Francis the most are the two Democratic candidates. Uh, you don't find Republican candidates in this campaign quoting uh, Pope Francis uh, very much. This would not have been the case a few years ago. And then on the Republican side, you have Trump shaking up uh, the religious conversation in the following way, that uh, really since the um, 1970s, late 1970s, early 1980s, We've had one notion of white evangelical Christian conservative politics in our head. I always say white because it's very important to remember that uh, a, the vast majority of African Americans, I think, are definitionally uh, evangelical Christians, uh, and they are not notoriously conservative in their views uh, on uh, social or economic justice issues. Um, and yet, despite these denunciations from many key quite conservative um, evangelical leaders. Uh, Trump, in many, many primaries, has done very well among evangelical voters. He has picked up a serious share of the evangelical vote, uh, particularly in parts of the Deep South. Um, but I think it's important to understand um, what might be happening with this split among evangelicals. One way to cast the issue, and it oversimplifies it a bit, is that some evangelicals are still voting on what they perceive as religious and moral issues, uh, and others are voting in a much more tribal way, uh, kind of defending their group. And indeed, um, I think the backlash around race and immigration that motivates some of the, uh, you know, a significant part of the Trump vote actually reminds us of something, which is many white evangelical Christians, particularly in the South, began moving to the right and to the Republicans long before um, uh, the rise of the religious right. They moved that way in response to civil rights uh, in the 1960s, and Trump um, is, ki is uh, uh, reminding us of that. Um, now, work crews to win uh, the nomination, um, I think that traditional patterns of white evangelical voting might re reassert themselves, at least for one more uh, election. But I think this split between what I will oversimplify as the tribal versus the religious uh, is really instructive about something uh, that is uh, happening uh, in our politics. Um, and two other quick points I want to make. One is um, that it is my view that um, the way in which uh, Hillary Clinton um, is most likely to solve this authenticity problem that the press, but not just the press, uh, associates with her, um, is if she is uh, far more out front and embracing of her Methodist faith and uh, its social uh, demands. I believe from conversation and from conversation with a lot of others uh, that the old social Methodist in Hillary uh, is a deeply authentic uh, Hillary Clinton. It is uh, who she is uh, and 
um, that this would, would convey something that I think her campaign hasn't conveyed very much. When she quotes John Wesley out on the campaign trail, uh, she seems to light up, and I think voters notice uh, that, and I think that will be part of the campaign. So, um, ironically, uh, given what we think of politics as living on the right for such a long time, it hasn't always lived on the right in the United States, and we can talk about that, um, you have an election where the evangelical movement is split, um, where uh, the Democratic frontrunner may find salvation through public uh, engagement with religion, and you have a Jewish socialist heading off to the Vatican to make a case about climate change and social justice that is in fact quite congenial uh, to Pope Francis's worldview. Um, in, America, in the American politics right now, uh, religion is working in mysterious ways, and we can only hope that eventually God will work in mysterious but helpful ways too. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is really a fascinating moment um, politically uh, in terms of the influence of religion and politics. And I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about what I see as really two very opposite tendencies with Francis and Trump, pulling the electorate in different kinds of ways. Um, Trump seems to me to be almost a sort of caricature of American individualism. You know, he's the cowboy who's self-reliant. He comes in, he gets things done. He's the autonomous individual. Um, the Catholic Church, as you know, has had a long history of suspicion of that kind of individualism, and they've really been focused much more on the common good. And so it seems to me that right now we have sort of two models of human flourishing, one where Trump says the, the way to make the world better is to get rid of any sort of restrictions on individual freedom, and another coming from the Pope and from other social justice advocates suggesting that we do need some limitations on human freedom and individualism for, for human flourishing. A, a couple of things on that. One, uh, hearty agreement, and one, perhaps, a friendly amendment on the question, if I could. The, the hearty agreement is I do think um, that uh, Americans are, uh, and have been from the beginning of the Republic, deeply divided between our devotion to individualism and our deep affection for community. I, I wrote a book called Our Divided Political mm -hmm. Heart one, that was about uh, this. And it isn't that we, are, we have just a communitarian camp and an individualistic camp. I think this division goes right down mm -hmm. uh, the middle of so many of us who are American. You even see it in the Declaration of Independence uh, where um, you know, the beginning is about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's sort of individual rights. Mm -hmm. And at the end, where the founders pledge their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor, and they realize that these goals can only be achieved through uh, common action. Um, and I also love to um, remind people, I occasionally do this in talks because I like what the answer sounds like, is to ask people, what is the first word of the American Constitution? So let's do it. What is the first word? <laughs> we. Exactly. We don't say it enough in our uh, country right now.